By the mid-1980s, the United States Air Force had risen from the ashes of Vietnam. It had been reorganized and re-equipped, but had not yet been tested in battle. Saddam Hussein would provide a testing ground in the Middle East. The USAF would dazzle the world with an unprecedented display of technological warfare. And now, the Air Force once again faces an uncertain future. Technological and strategic possibilities are unlimited, but the money to realize them is not. I'm Walter Boyne, and this is the story of the United States Air Force. The 70s and the 80s saw the emergence of an Air Force determined never again to fight a war under the terms imposed upon it in Vietnam. When America confronted Saddam Hussein in the Middle East in the early 90s, new attitudes and new weapons were tested under fire. In the 70s and 80s, new generation fighters began to pour into tactical Air Force units. The mighty B-1B came online with the Strategic Air Command. The Fairchild A-10, the Warthog, entered service as a ground attack aircraft. Airborne command and control was extensively developed. Among additions to command and control equipment, were new airborne warning and control aircraft, AWACS. The E-8 J-STARS can detect ground movements by radar. It was in development as the 90s began. All these aircraft were capable of contributing to both strategic and tactical warfare. The USAF was now a very different force from the one that had suffered a decade in the jungles of Vietnam. When the Soviet Union began to show signs of dissolution, the military services had the foresight to plan war games, envisioning a crisis in the Middle East. But a failure of intelligence gathering prevented them anticipating Iraq's reckless adventure of August 2, 1990. Saddam Hussein's forces swept into Kuwait. They took only hours to place the fourth largest army in the world on the borders of Saudi Arabia. On August 7, 1990, the first tangible sign of U.S. commitment occurred. 48 F-15 Eagles from the 1st Tactical Fighter Wing made a dramatic non-stop flight from Langley Air Force Base, Virginia to Dharan, Saudi Arabia. F-15s, like most fighters, are uncomfortable to fly after two or three hours. The flight to the Persian Gulf took up to 17 hours, with as many as nine in-flight refuelings en route. It was the most arduous and most effective show the flag effort in aviation history. It deterred Saddam Hussein from plunging on to Saudi Arabia. Had the Iraqi army rolled on, the ultimate victory in Desert Storm would have been delayed for months. The F-15's marathon flight had achieved its objective. American air and sea lift capacity was not great enough to place large forces in Saudi Arabia in a short time. 
But Saddam's hesitation gave the United States time to build up forces by using the excellent Saudi Arabian port and base facilities. The early F-15 show of strength was followed by a continuous buildup of American forces. The dray horse work was done by the Military Airlift Command. It brought in paratroopers, tanks, Patriot missile batteries, and all the incredible equipment needed for modern warfare. By the end of the campaign, almost five billion ton miles of personnel and cargo would be flown. As Air Force Chief of Staff General Merrill McPeak explained at the time, it was a massive airlift undertaking. It's really something like moving Oklahoma City, all of its people, all of its vehicles, all of its food, all of its household goods, halfway around the world. In essence, we're doing the equivalent of a Berlin airlift every six weeks, a magnificent performance and one only the United States, I think, could have achieved. In Saudi Arabia, the USAF went into action while the other coalition forces assembled. Electronic surveillance of the battlefield began. Among the aircraft used was the latest version of the Lockheed U-2. In a risky move, the two prototype Grumman Boeing E-8A J-STARS aircraft were sent to the Gulf, six years ahead of their scheduled deployment date. The E-8As are designed primarily to survey the land battle, but they also supplement the AWACS in controlling the air battle. The J-STARS were so efficient in detecting ground movement that the Iraqis would be forced to stop moving their vehicles and convoys. Instead, they would try to spirit them across the desert floor in ones and twos. Demand for the J-STARS capability came from every side. They proved to be the keystone of the execution of what would be a textbook air-land battle. For five and a half long months, the U.S. exhausted every diplomatic effort to get Saddam Hussein to release his hold on Kuwait territory. While the negotiations went on, the United States was building up the most massive striking force since the Vietnam War. But in this war, the mistakes of Vietnam would not be repeated. President George Bush and Secretary Cheney enunciated their policies. Then they left General Colin Powell and the military commanders on the scene to carry them out. No, the only uh, Iraqi action I'm aware of uh, was the artillery. This was not another Vietnam. This time, the rules of engagement made sense. The war was to be fought as intensely and as precisely as possible, with the idea of winning in the shortest possible time. General Norman Schwarzkopf was designated commander of all the coalition forces. He chose Lieutenant General Charles A. Horner as commander, Central Air Forces. Horner's job was to coordinate all air operations of the coalition. Given the high level of participation by different Allied forces in the Gulf War, a single air commander was a necessity. The combined planning operation was about to be tested. As the sun set on the evening of January 16, 1991, secret preparations for the coalition attack were completed. We knew we needed to operate in Iraqi airspace, so he was going to have the home port advantage. We had to penetrate into his territory. To do that, we had to take apart and disrupt his ability to stop us from coming in. In other words, we had to disintegrate his integrated air defense setup. At 2.59 a.m. Baghdad time on January 17th, standard patrols by American AWACS and fighters were the only apparent activity. The situation seemed normal to the Iraqis. At 3 o'clock a.m., an 
air attack of unprecedented ferocity blasted Iraqi air defenses. Communications, power grids, and command bunkers were hit with devastating force. Iraqi command and control and radar defense systems were blinded. They had been struck by bombs, Air Force and Army helicopters, Navy missiles, and a combination of many kinds of radar jamming equipment. I think going downtown Baghdad. At the same time, Lockheed F-117A stealth fighters began their deadly attack. They opened the path for the other bombers. This weird assemblage of angles and facets is the Lockheed Martin F-117A stealth fighter. Designed to elude enemy radar, it was used with brilliant success in the Persian Gulf War. There, it flew almost 1,300 missions with an 80% success rate. Best of all, there were absolutely no casualties. The F-117s, only 2.5% of the force, took out 30% of the toughest targets. They hit 37 the first night. There is no indication that they were ever tracked by Iraqi radar. In the Gulf War, the arduous F-117 missions were always flown at night. They averaged five and a half hours. 30 minutes of this time was continuous exposure to anti-aircraft fire. In spite of the danger of enemy fire and the incredible swiftness of the attacks, the bombing accuracy averaged an amazing 85%. The loss rate was zero. The F-117A proved invulnerable. The American public was almost as stunned as the Iraqis by the continuous television presentation of flawlessly executed attacks. We took special care to make sure and we attacked only military targets, and we attacked them quite precisely. Air crews were informed to bring home the uh, ordnance if they weren't sure they were locked to the right target, and we made very few mistakes. It was a deadly business. There were hazards everywhere, in high gross weight takeoffs, and in blacked out, radio silent, in-flight refuelings at night. In the inferno of anti-aircraft fire over Baghdad, each arcing trace was potentially a golden BB for crewmen, the shot with their names on it. Curiously, the first air-to-air -air victory of the war went to an unarmed USAF EF-111A radar jamming plane. An Iraqi Mirage fired a missile at it. The Raven turned and dived to evade the missile, pulling out a few hundred feet above the ground. The Mirage, in hot pursuit, failed to pull out and crashed into the ground behind the Raven. Departure Gulf 35 out of 1,000 for 4,000. In its first day, the USAF had launched more sorties than the Iraqi Air Force had flown in eight years of war against Iran. The Iraqis were unable to cope with the onslaught. With few exceptions, they declined combat. They sat on the ground until their shelters proved vulnerable. Then they elected to fly to safety in the bosom of their recent enemy, Iran. It looks to us as though they stood down on the ninth day of the war. And these clumps here, this one and this big clump, are the flights to Iran. Es essentially, it looks as though the Iraqi Air Force gave up at this point and uh, went to Iran. We had air superiority after about two days. We had virtual air supremacy in a couple of weeks uh, because nothing could challenge the F-15 and the F-14, the F-18. 
Some factors in the Gulf air war are often overlooked. The concept of total force, the employment of regular reservist and National Guard assets was demonstrated convincingly. By February 1, 1991, 17,500 reservists were on active duty for the Gulf War. They flew and maintained first-line combat-ready equipment. One in four reservists was a woman. This reflected contemporary social conditions. But it posed a genuine problem in Middle Eastern culture, where women have a rigidly defined and limited place in society. The reserves plunged into combat with Fairchild A-10 attack aircraft. Everybody loves an underdog, and for many years, the Fairchild Republic A-10 was just that. The first aircraft designed for the Air Force specifically as a close support airplane, it was considered by many to be too slow to be combat effective. But the crews loved it. It was rugged and easy to maintain. They affectionately called it the Warthog. The A-10s attacked every sort of ground target, including Scud missiles. Reserve units flew more than 5,200 combat sorties without any losses. A-10s were also flown by the 23rd Tactical Fighter Wing, the direct descendant of the famous World War II Flying Tigers. Most of the systems on the aircraft are redundant. We can lose both hydraulic systems and still fly by cables. Uh, you can see the engines are high mounted for protection. Uh, we can fly on one engine. We can fly with a piece of the wing gone, the tail gone, whatever. So we feel pretty confident up here that uh, even if we do take a few hits, we'll still be able to get home and do our job the next day. 12,500 members of the Air Guard responded to the call of duty. 5,000 of them went to the Gulf. The very first American aircraft to land in Saudi Arabia after the Kuwait invasion was a Mississippi Air National Guard C-141. In the course of the air war, Guard F-16s flew 3,550 missions. Tankers offloaded 200 million pounds of fuel in 14,000 hookups with aircraft of all the coalition. KC-135s and the more modern McDonnell Douglas KC-10s refueled aircraft constantly. Well, I don't know if that looks like a lot of work or not, but <laughs> it is. It was an impressive showing by true citizen soldiers. General Dynamics F-111 had been the subject of bad press for years, but in the Gulf, it covered itself with glory. F-111s dropped more than 7 million pounds of precision-guided ammunition in 42 days. They took out 245 hardened aircraft shelters, hundreds of bunkers and bridges, and as many as 1,500 tanks and personnel carriers. A veteran of Vietnam also made a comeback. The angular but oddly beautiful McDonnell Douglas F-4 Phantom was one of the most versatile aircraft ever to enter the Air Force's inventory. It was used as a fighter, a bomber, and a reconnaissance plane. Later in its career, it took on the most demanding mission of all, that of Wild Weasel, the suppression of enemy air defenses. This particular aircraft, an F-4G, was used in the Persian Gulf War in 1991. There, Almost 30 years after the type had entered service, and in competition with high-tech aircraft like the stealth fighter, this aircraft fired more than 40 missiles against the enemy air defenses. The venerable B-52Gs once again proved their worth as flying artillery. They were able to place tremendous amounts of bombs on troop concentrations. They were especially tough on Saddam's crack troops, the Republican Guard. 
The ugly Fairchild A-10 Warthog used missiles and guns not only to suppress enemy tanks, but also in air-to-air -air combat. A reservist pilot shot down an Iraqi helicopter to record the first ever A-10 air-to-air kill. New equipment and new tactics were used with imagination. Training was a key factor in the successes achieved with both new and old aircraft. So was the quality of the personnel flying and supporting the aircraft. For six months, the men and women of the U.S. Air Force were located in a foreign environment with extraordinary climatic and cultural differences. Throughout this extended period, they maintained a level of spirit and morale that made the crucial difference. Aircraft and equipment were simply not allowed to go down for maintenance. No matter how many hours or how much ingenuity it took, the weapons were ready for launch on schedule. The Air Force and all the services worked hard to sustain morale. There were as many entertainments and creature comforts as possible. There were frequent phone calls home and assurance of service support in case of difficulty. But the prime factor in maintaining morale was much more fundamental. The men and women believed they were fighting for a just cause, and they knew that they were being allowed to fight to win. Much more had been learned from Vietnam than anyone had realized. Saddam Hussein had counted on the American public to manifest a Vietnam War mentality and demand the return of its troops. That did not happen. In the process of victory, a new condition emerged, one that was recognized at the time by only a very few people at the top of the command structure. Since the Gulf War, it has become more obvious. It is the fact that air power has been raised to another level, space power. Space is the natural extension of the USAF's operating medium. The Air Force operates over 90% of all military space systems. It supplies almost 50% of the total U.S. space budget, including NASA's share. Although there are no weapons in space, the efficient use of space can give a striking force dominance on the battlefield. Those concepts put an enormous premium on information, on information warfare, on surveillance, that is, on battlefield awareness. With dominant awareness goes information superiority on the battlefield. Doesn't do you any good to be aware if you can't pass that awareness to people who need it. In the Gulf War, a remote sensing satellite was used to give U.S. commanders an overall view of the military situation. Navstar Global Positioning System satellites were used to position air crews for parachute drops and to locate pickup zones for special operations. Individual soldiers carry GPS terminals in their backpacks. Standard navigation and weather satellites were used to brief the aircraft crews of all services with optimum flight paths. Communication satellites made everything work. Everyone, from the soldier at the point of combat to the aircraft waiting to deploy, was in touch. Global Positioning System satellites are the best example of the precise control that space-based equipment can provide. 
A network of satellites make up a system to give continuous coverage over the entire Earth, allowing any user to plot their position anywhere in the world to within a 30-foot radius. Space power came of age with Desert Storm. Space systems became an integral part of an enormous battle. They proved crucial to its outcome. Its net effect was to make the operational combat commands eager customers for space services in the future. The Navstar Global Positioning System provided the means by which Allied land, sea, and air forces could navigate to a point and then fire with unprecedented accuracy. In preceding wars, it had been impossible to know with precision where the enemy was. It was equally impossible to know precisely where your own forces were. In the Gulf War, this was no longer the case. The concept of battlefield awareness came of age. The United States Air Force space power was a major factor in its effectiveness. F-16s, operating in the ground attack role, use GPS to arrive at the initial point of their bombing runs. F-15s used another electronic marvel called Lantern to hit their targets. The highly appropriate acronym Lantern stands for Low Altitude Navigation and Targeting Infrared for Night. In the Gulf, enemy targets were at its mercy. The tanks try to get off the road. You can see them leaving the road now and driving out into the desert. And in fact, some of the, the tankers tried to run away. You see the people running away. And uh, of course, we continue to attack. This is a moving tank moving into the desert off the road. And we continue to, uh, to attack it. When the Iraqis were fleeing north out of Kuwait, uh, they weren't dumb. They went at night. But we were ready for them. The F-15Es with their lantern pods, they shot up a bunch of vehicles at the front, and they shot up a bunch of vehicles at the back. And then during the day, we pounded the heck out of it, making, by the way, making buzzing passes over the convoy to warn the drivers to get away, because we weren't trying to kill people. We were trying to kill equipment. After 43 days of revolutionary high-tech warfare and unprecedented cooperation between air and land forces, victory in the Gulf was complete. It was run by Schwarzkopf in a way that he elected to run it, and it was, he was backed up by Colin Powell, and he was backed up by the Secretary of Defense and backed up by the President. And to me, if you're going to fight a war, that's the way to fight it. Take the war to the enemy as quickly, as cleanly, as effectively, and as powerfully as you can. And that was offered by air power, and he used it very wisely. In 43 days of intense day and night combat, we only lost one fighter every 3,200 combat sorties. Uh, and we only had three fighter deaths, three. Now, never in the history of armed conflict between two opposing armed military forces has there been so much damage inflicted on the one side with so little damage incurred by the other. Never, never before. Victory in the Persian Gulf brought a brief period of triumph to the armed forces and to the civilians at home. A good war had been fought and won with minimum losses. The expensive high-tech equipment that had been so controversial over the years proved itself. The United States had established itself unmistakably as the world's sole superpower. In the Pentagon, even as the Gulf War was being fought, plans were being made to reduce the size of all armed services by 25% or more. Studies were underway to change the Air Force mission to fit in with new funding guidelines. Planning dictated that the great air commands that won the Persian Gulf War 
laden with tradition and battle honors, would be deactivated and relegated to history. For many people, the most incredible change was the dissolution of the Strategic Air Command. SAC had been perhaps the greatest single reason for American success in the Cold War. Three generations of Americans had grown up in the security of Curtis LeMay's creation. Without ever dropping a nuclear weapon in anger, SAC accomplished its mission. It had withstood the turbulence of the times for 46 years. It had foregone its nuclear role to become a dropper of conventional iron bombs when necessary. But it never lost sight of its goal of nuclear deterrence. Almost as startling as SAC's demise was the deactivation of the Tactical Air Command. TAC, the USAF fighter force, had been tested and proved in Vietnam. It was brought to the height of its powers in the Gulf War. In the same way, the distinguished lineage of MAC the Military Airlift Command extended from flying the hump in World War II to the Berlin Airlift to performing relief work in Russia. Now Mac was no more. The United States Air Force, in the form America had come to know it over almost half a century, was gone. Part of the reason for deactivation of the fine old Air Force commands was the blurring and distinction of tactical and strategic operations in the Gulf War. Tactical fighters like the F-15 had been assigned strategic targets. A-10 Warthogs, usually frontline ground attack aircraft, were used far in the enemy rear to strike Scud missile carriers. Clearly, a strategic air command and a tactical air command had lost their meaning a long time ago. That there are strategic missions and tactical missions, but I don't know how to define a strategic system or a tactical system anymore. SAC, TAC, and MAC were replaced by two new commands. These commands were reduced in size and streamlined in structure. They combined elements of the old organizations. The first is the Air Combat Command. It combines former SAC and TAC elements for combat operation. It's known as putting the shooters together. Its focus is on deterrence and limited wars. Its mission is to project U.S. power around the world. The second new organization is the Air Mobility Command. It combines the airlift elements of MAC with about half of SAC's former tanker force. This combination forms a team with global reach. The one uh, thing we have to remember, though, uh, there was so much hyperbole associated with that reorganization, with the Air Force patting itself on the back, that obscured the fact that this was the most dramatic drawdown in Air Force history setting aside World War II. The most dramatic drawdown. It had a traumatic effect on the force. Immediately after the Gulf War, the Department of Defense began working on the removal of a million military and civilian employees from all the armed forces. There was absolutely nothing going on that would lead us to believe that the defense budget was going any direction but down. The Air Force was given a target personnel strength of 430,000 by 1997, a reduction of 29% from a decade before. There is irony in making drastic changes in the size and shape of a military force that has just scored the most decisive victory in its history. This irony was not lost on the man behind the changes, Chief of Staff at the time, General Merrill A. McPeak. 
One of the things we have to do, and that will make our job so tough over the next few years, is we have to keep being both those things. We have to continue to be the world's best Air Force, and we have to continue to provide the full range of comprehensive aerospace services and activities in a, a different international environment and in a different domestic setting. That's going to be a challenge for all of us. Within a few years, the Air Force will have 40% fewer bombers, 50% fewer ICBMs, and 30% fewer fighters. Downsizing has been very traumatic from a people standpoint. You have lots of people who, who had assumed that, that their life would be a military career. And of course, they, have, they don't have that opportunity. But from an equipment and capability standpoint, downsizing has really not done a lot of violence to that so far. Instead of maintaining a defensive force in Europe, America will now have only a presence. That means a force sufficient to gain time until reinforcements can come from the United States. As the Air Force consolidates and decentralizes, it is also trying to manage an abrupt decline in procurement. The problem is more serious than a potential deficiency in numbers. The very existence of a defense industry may be threatened. Current United States strategy is dependent on ample warning time of a new threat. That warning time would theoretically allow the United States to reconstitute its industrial base and armed forces. In essence, the definition of warning time has been drastically changed. It used to refer to the 30 minutes SAC would have to get bombers into the air after an attack had been launched. Now, warning time for reconstitution is four years. The amount of time necessary to gear up industry and mobilize forces that have been disestablished. Four years might not be enough. Some industries, especially those supplying electrical optical gear, computer chips, and other high-tech materials, might not exist anymore. The United States already has a critical reliance on foreign suppliers, especially Japan. Japan is our ally today, but perhaps 10 years from now, it could be a bitter trade enemy. Japanese writers have said that Japan can control the world's superpowers through its production of critical components. The situation now is not unlike Britain's infamous 10-year rule. It was introduced after World War I by Winston Churchill, and it stunted the growth of British military aviation. Each year, if no threat was apparent for 10 years, it was assumed that there would be no war in that time. Military spending was cut to the bone. The standard and number of military aircraft and other weapons dropped. Britain became weak. It suffered in a series of humiliating diplomatic defeats at the hands of Hitler. Britain's weakness eventually contributed to the outbreak of World War II. The Cold War is over. The hazards to world peace are not. Unexpected events can occur without warning. The threats of the future are not well defined. The crystal ball is cloudy, just as cloudy as it can be. I mean, what kind of military do you need? What kind of incidents will be involved? What, what will be our relationship with China as it emerges into being a, a, a more of a superpower? I mean, these are tough issues. And there are 200,000 tons of plutonium loose in this world. It's very difficult to make. It's far more difficult to unmake. And, you know, you can take 15 kilograms of uh, plutonium and uh, combine it with tritium and take Denver off the map and probably get Colorado Springs in the bargain. We have a track record of zero accuracy on, on know, knowing what's coming next, but I'll guarantee you something is. U.S. planning is based on the assumption 
that a major world war is unlikely. But there are many possibilities, like this hostile North Korean scenario. Some are probable, some far-fetched, but all need to be considered. Russia may gather its strength and resume an expansionist agenda. The Republic of China could develop a missile fleet and begin an expansionist policy that would threaten American interests in the Far East. Any one of a number of rogue states could assemble an ICBM arsenal and hold the world hostage. A federation of fundamentalist Muslim states could acquire a nuclear arsenal. Over time, China and Japan might see that their best interests lie in cooperation. Such an alliance could end Western dominance in Asia. We would be uh, insane if we ignored the potential for uh, for real disaster or real problems, military or civilian, uh, with a, a major nuclear stockpile that doesn't have the constraints of a real organized and disciplined force. I don't know that, it's, that the American people can fully appreciate the absolute devastation that would come from nuclear weapons. You think of nuclear weapons as big bombs. They're not. They're a whole orders of magnitude more than anything we've ever seen before. We're going to have to have these weapons because we're going to be challenged. People say, well, by whom? I don't know. But three times in my lifetime, I wouldn't know who was going to challenge us. And we were challenged, and we were pushed to the wall. But besides risk, the future holds promise. The heart of the technological revolution, the computer, will evolve at a rate faster than the average person's comprehension. Advances in computers will fuel advances in aerodynamics, electronics, and communications. In 1994, the Air Force's Scientific Advisory Board was asked for an independent view of the way technological change will shape the 21st century Air Force. The result was a 15-volume study, New World Vistas. It enumerates dazzling possibilities, including uninhabited combat aerial vehicles and one million pound gross weight transport. It is sweeping and exciting in scope, but economic reality may prevent these theories from becoming fact. The Air Force of the first quarter of the next century will reflect today's ongoing trends. Small, highly trained forces armed with high technology equipment. The huge McDonnell Douglas C-17 transport is one of the primary systems that need to be acquired to sustain a modern force. Another is the Lockheed Martin F-22 air superiority fighter. A third system is the joint strike fighter, capable of vertical takeoffs and landings. The Northrop Grumman B-2 stealth bomber will lead the fleet. But the bigger and faster Rockwell B-1B will be the primary bomber. The F-117A stealth fighter will remain in service. In the long term, just as aircraft once faced a sound barrier, so do new technological developments face a cost barrier. A major effort is being made to contain new system costs within achievable limits. But a perceived decline in threat and a geometric rise in cost may drive the Air Force away from its quest for new equipment with continually improved performance. It may turn instead to a maintenance mode in which existing systems are improved gradually over long periods of time.
It is not inconceivable that the weapon systems introduced in the next 20 years might endure for a century. There is vast public sentiment, scientific and romantic, for a return to manned space exploration. This includes establishing bases on the moon as a prerequisite for the exploration of Mars. The Air Force is involved in the research necessary for stunning new technical achievements. If the economy permits, a mission to Mars before 2020 is conceivable. But in the face of pressing social problems, the budget is likely to dictate against such a project. If so, the Air Force can put Mars on hold. It can concentrate on a less glamorous, but more necessary role as a national defender using proven weapons. No matter what the coming challenges are, no matter how low the budget levels sink, the future success of the Air Force depends on attracting the same sort of leaders and innovators as those who have served it so well in the past. In all its stormy existence, as a fledgling air service in World War I, as a gigantic force in World War II, as the winner of the Cold War, the Air Force has always managed to get the right people in the right jobs at the right time. There is no reason to doubt that it will continue to do so in the future. Thank you.